everyone. I am Gul Nihal Azbey. I am a professor and extension specialist in natural resources program. On behalf of the Delaware State University community, we would like to welcome you our Earth Week and Arbor Day celebration. This is an important event for us because this is the day that we show our appreciation of our planet. And we are dedicated to show that we are going to preserve and conserve our important resources. For our Earth Week and Arbor Day celebrations, we have a great line of speakers and activities are planned. And our first keynote speaker uh, of, the, of today is um, our Secretary of Agriculture, it, the, Mr. Michael Hughes. And our second keynote speaker, who will be talking about tree campus and importance of trees. Overall, our US forester, Dr. Michael Valenti. And we also have our EPA partner, Dr. Cindy Caparoli, as our third keynote speaker. Dr. Cheris Winston will be talking about our partnership with EPA. And Dr. Kimberly Milligan will have a demo and presentation on the laboratory water quality lab that is established as part of the EST EPA partnership. And we will have Dr. Arast Arastitis. Can we cut down there? Yeah, we can cut, we can cut there and pick that up. Dr. Arastitis Marcano will be talking about renewable energy lab. And later uh, during the day, we will be having demo by the students and the cooperative extension staff and the faculty member on pollinator. So we have some exciting activities. We would like you to enjoy um, all these activities for today. Since 1912, Arbor Day has been a national holiday, celebrating volunteer efforts to plant as many trees as possible in an effort to beautify America, while improving sustainability and maintaining a healthy environment. This is a long tradition that goes back as far as 1574, when the mayor of a small Spanish village instituted the first such celebration in Europe or America, and which is still celebrated there nearly 450 years later. Delaware State University has been a major partner in Arbor Day activities for nearly a decade, and we have the distinction of being the first historically black college or university in the country to be declared a tree campus in 2014. With our main Dover campus, our Kirkwood Highway facility, two farms, and now the beautiful downtown Dover Wesley campus, tree planting and maintenance is an integral part of our own beautification and sustainability plans. We are exceptionally proud to stand alongside millions of Americans, from school children through large corporations who are dedicated to the principles of Arbor Day. This effort is truly representative of the power of we. Good afternoon. My name is Donna Brown. I'm the Associate Dean for Extension. Today I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Secretary Michael T. Skews. But first I'd like to make a statement about why we're here, to celebrate Earth Day. Today we are celebrating these important occasions to protect preserve and restore our precious environment and to keep it healthy for many generations to enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker for the hour, Delaware's own Secretary of Agriculture, Michael T. Skews. In 2017, Michael Skews was reappointed by Governor John C. Carney as Delaware Secretary of Agriculture. Skews previously worked with the U.S. Department of Agriculture as Acting U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Acting Deputy Secretary of Agriculture, and Under Secretary for Farm and Foreign Agricultural Services. As Under Secretary, he oversaw USDA's Farm Service Agency, Risk Management Agency, and Foreign Agricultural Services. He served as Delaware Secretary of Agriculture from 2001 to 2008, and also served as 
chief of staff to former Governor Ruth Ann Minner. He has received the Medal of Achievement from the Delmarva Poultry Association in 2006, the Secretary's Award for Distinguished Service to Delaware Agriculture in 2012, the Ambassador Circle Award by the National Association of State Department of Agriculture in 2016, as well as the National Future Farmers of America VIP Citation Award and the World Trade Center Delaware Champion of Trade Award in 2019. More recently, Secretary Skews signed the Memorandum of Understanding to expand joint activities with the Environmental Protection Agency to support cleaner water and to improve and to increase sustainable farms. Secretary Eskews, along with his wife Patrice, live in Smyrna on a corn, soybean, and wheat farm. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our own Secretary of Agriculture, Michael T. Skews. From Earth Day to Arbor Day, April is a month of celebrating our success in protecting our environment. But it's also about taking steps to improve our footprint on the land we have so future generations may reap the benefits of our actions rather than suffer the consequences. So as we all come together as part of the Delaware State University community, I want to thank you for joining us today in celebrating our most extensive resource, Earth. Delaware farmers are leading the way, growing food, helping the environment, and creating jobs. As the Delaware Secretary of Agriculture, I have the good fortune of working with 2,300 family farms that make their living on 530,000 acres of land in Delaware. That's 42% of Delaware's land mass, where farmers are growing corn, soybeans, wheat, poultry, dairy, livestock, and fruits and vegetables to do their part in feeding Delawareans along with people across our country and the world. As Delaware's number one industry, agriculture's success lies with our family farms. For our farmers, the land is their life, their livelihood, and their legacy. For a farmer, being a good steward of the land is essential to sustainability. Last year, the American Farmland Trust ranked our Ag Lands Preservation Program the second most effective farmland preservation program in the country. We have permanently preserved 139,000 acres or approximately 26% of Delaware farmland. The reality is that farmland preservation is not only about passing the land down to the next generation, it's also about making sure future generations have locally grown food available to feed their families. It's also about smart growth and ensuring that we continue to have open space for years to come. It's important to understand from the farmer to the policymakers that the use of nutrients impacts the local environment and everything downstream as water makes its way to the ocean. Each state handles its nutrient management differently, and honestly, states who are not doing their part can negatively impact a state downstream. Water quality has become more of an issue not only in the Chesapeake region, but in the Northeast. But for farmers in the central region of the country, the Great Lakes region, and for farmers and citizens in the Gulf of Mexico dealing with hypoxia issues caused by those states bordering the Mississippi River. Along with the land, Delaware's family farmers play a significant role in taking care of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. 
Delaware has been a pioneer in water quality protection. We recognized early on the importance of partnering with farmers in reducing environmental impact, and our farmers stepped up to the challenge. Our nutrient management program and commission work diligently to ensure that we do our part in protecting the environment. Our farmers have been implementing best management practices for over 30 years, and research has proven that Delaware is making a positive impact. We are committed to protecting and improving the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries, and are working to meet the Chesapeake Bay program's restoration goals. By 2017, Delaware completed some or all of its 2025 reduction goals, including 75% of nitrogen and 100% of phosphorus, and we continue to improve each year. Even though farmers have doubled production since 1985, they have effectively controlled the nitrogen and phosphorus levels, demonstrating that Delaware farmers' accelerated use of best management practices keeps up with production demands. Some of the best proactive measures in protecting our environment haven't come from regulators and bureaucracy, but from farmers innovating their production practices. Growers are increasingly using techniques such as building manure storage structures, planting trees, conducting soil tests, and planting cover crops. So why would a farmer plant a crop they don't harvest and doesn't provide any income? Research shows that cover crops are the best tool in Delaware, environmentally and economically, to reduce agricultural nutrient runoff and improve water quality. Furthermore, cover crops help mitigate climate change by sequestering carbon, improving soil health, improving the resiliency of fields to pests, and reducing the amount of fertilizers and pesticides required. The use of cover crops will help Delaware reach its nutrient reduction goals for the Chesapeake Bay, the Inland Bays, and the Delaware River and Bay. Before fiscal year 2020, Delaware farmers planted approximately 80,000 acres of cover crops. By increasing funding available for cost share programs, we have seen these rates rise, increasing environmental benefits to all of our waterways. When it comes to recycling, Delaware farmers are doing their part right along with all of you. In 2020, our pesticide section recycled 45,190 pounds of pesticide containers and removed 130,000 pounds of unwanted pesticide products from nearly 300 farms. Farmers can decrease their usage of these products due to our university's outstanding research to develop new technologies to help crops combat pests and other obstacles to increase yields. Simultaneously, we have professors and students at DSU who are working to improve these foods' nutrition to help feed people across the world. Here in the United States, we are fortunate to have the safest, most affordable food supply in the world. More than 240 family farms are kicking off the growing season this month so that you can have access to Delaware-grown fruits, vegetables, and herbs. Our dairy farms and livestock operations continue to offer locally produced ice cream, milk, cheeses, and meats. I know many people during the pandemic learned that their food does not start its journey to their table from the grocery store. When the shelves were bare due to the breakdown in the supply chain and Delawareans needed to find food to put on their table, many met their local family farmer for the first time. I encourage every one of you to continue developing that relationship. Continue to buy local, because when you do, you not only get the freshest Delaware has to offer, you help keep small farms productive, which in turn boosts and grows the local economy. We have experienced drastic changes in our lives over the past year. We've experienced suffering and hardship, and we shared that experience with people from all over the world. So as you leave today, I want you to think about how you can make a difference globally. 
I want you to think about how you could solve the problem I'm getting ready to share with you because it has enormous implications on the world's health. Not only the people, but also the environment. Are you ready? About one third of the world's food never gets consumed due to food waste and spoilage. According to a United Nations report, approximately 30% of the world's food is lost along supply chains from harvest to the retail level. Suppose you're exporting food to a third world country on refrigeration. It arrives at the port with no refrigeration available or has to be transported without refrigeration after being kept constant for so long. In that case, spoilage quickly sets in en route to its destination. Poor infrastructure is a huge issue, not only in getting quality, nutritious food to the consumer. It is also a problem when a farmer learns new techniques to become sustainable, yet he or she fails every time to get the product to those in need because of an issue outside their control. These countries need affordable transportation solutions, improvement in their infrastructure, and education on the crops that will be more successful for their climate, soil, and skills to feed the world starting at home. Every one of you ha has an opportunity in front of you to make a difference and to solve our world's problems with the knowledge and skills that you are gaining from your time at Delaware State University. What will you do? What I know is that we need to employ the next generation in agriculture. In 2015, Purdue University released the results of their study on the employment opportunities for college graduates in food, agriculture, natural resources, and the environment for the years 2015 to 2020. They found growth trending in these areas with colleges graduating only 35,400 students each year for a career field that needs 57,300 skilled employees. These statistics have not decreased. If anything, after the pandemic, they have increased as the rest of the country has come to understand that agriculture is essential to America's success. More than 300 career fields involve agriculture, but the main categories these companies are hiring graduates include management and business, science and engineering, food and biomaterials production, and education, communication, and governmental services. As one of the premier land-grant universities focusing on agriculture, Delaware State University students are fortunate to have an edge on the competition. In light of Arbor Day coming up, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Delaware's Department of Agriculture Forest Service actively manages our state forest with more than 20,000 acres of land open to the public. Take time to get outside and enjoy the beauty of our three forests, Tabor State Forest, Blackbird State Forest, and Redden State Forest. Whether it's for hiking, camping, hunting, horseback riding, or just finding some quiet time to reflect on your life this past year. Take this time to think about how you will impact our state, our country, and the world through your time at Delaware State University. How will you be a good steward of our land? In what ways will you protect our watersheds? What will you do to solve problems like food waste that is impacting the ability to feed the world? The opportunities are there for you, but you have to take the charge and make a difference. Thank you. Happy Arbor Day, everyone. I'm Cynthia Ongwa, curator of the herbarium here at Delaware State University. We celebrate Arbor Day every year as part of our commitment to a green environment. It provides us with countless benefits like clean air, clean water, and food. And when we take care of trees, we also take care of ourselves and other living beings. Here at Delaware State University, we maintain an arboretum, a collection of living trees that make our campus green, beautiful, and healthy, and that also provide to the wildlife on campus. 
Our arboretum is rich of 170 species of trees and shrubs, of which 70 are native to Delaware, and still many others are native to North America. The trees here have also a rich history, like this shingle oak that is now on the state record for being the largest in Delaware. And given its size, it probably witnessed at least half of the history of this university. As we celebrate Tree Day, let us strive to be more tree-friendly and tree-minded so that tomorrow can look greener, can feel cooler, and can function better. Indeed, a tree planted today is tomorrow's community forest. Today is also a big day for Delaware State University as we celebrate our 10th anniversary as a Tree Campus Higher Education, formerly known as Tree Campus USA. And we are still the only one in Delaware. Being a Tree Campus is also a journey that we have shared with our longtime partner, the Delaware Forest Service, which is led by Dr. Michael Valenti. A long-time forestry uh, program administrator and an avid proponent of trees. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Valenti uh, to this virtual celebration. Greetings, Delaware State University. This is Mike Valenti, the administrator for the Delaware Forest Service. And I want to congratulate you for your 10th year as a Tree Campus USA. You're still the only university college in the state of Delaware that has that moniker. So congratulations again. So I've had a long association with Delaware State University. I actually started as an adjunct faculty member back in 2002, so it's almost been 20 years. And I've seen a lot of changes over the years to the physical part of the campus, new buildings, uh, a lot of new students, new programs. But one thing has remained constant throughout that time, and that has been the beauty of your campus, your trees and your shrubs, and the care that you take in maintaining these living things that, that do so much for us. There's so many natural benefits that come from trees and shrubs and a great looking landscape. And your university looks great. So when you have visitors, dignitaries, and potential students coming to visit your campus, one of the first things they notice is those trees and those flowering shrubs. So congratulations again for taking care of your campus and providing all those natural benefits. I want to talk a little bit about forest health in Delaware. We just finished our forest action plan. It was an update from our 2010 plan, and it was published late last year in 2020. And in that plan, we did an assessment of the entire forest of Delaware, and then we developed a strategy to help conserve and preserve those forests for, for future generations. And I got to tell you that we're in a good, good position right now because our forests are healthy, but the, the biggest challenge that we have in, in forestry, of course, is development. As more people move to the state and more developments are put in, unfortunately, we lose some of our forests. My hope is that we can maintain a base level of forests, healthy forests for future generations. We don't have very many pests in Delaware. The southern pine beetle is, is not doing much damage to our pines. The gypsy moth we have not heard of for the last 20 years or so. The biggest threat we have right now in our forest is the emerald ash borer. You may have read about it. It's a very tiny green beetle and it outright kills ash. And uh, we don't have very much ash in the natural environment, fortunately, but in, the, in our urban community forest, we have quite a few ash trees. And I know there are ash trees on the Delaware State campus. And as that insect spreads, it's probably going to kill most of those trees. So there are about 230 million trees that are more than five inches in diameter in the state of Delaware based on inventory and analysis. And that's about how many trees have been killed by the emerald ash borer so far in the United States. So we can expect more trees to die, and I, I hope that they find a cure for that insect or they find some varieties that are resistant to attack. So it's really important in Delaware to maintain forest health, and that's both rural forests and urban community forests like you have at Delaware State University's campus. They provide so many natural benefits. Just think about it for a minute, all the things that trees provide. Uh, I would challenge you to go a day without using a product from a tree. 
But more, more and more, people are concerned with our atmosphere and the amount of carbon dioxide that is in the atmosphere. And trees do something really amazing. Not only do they absorb that carbon dioxide and sequester it, but they store that carbon in their fibers. So when we cut down a tree during a harvest and we turn that tree into lumber, that carbon is stored. So people are taking a closer look at healthy forests helping us to solve this climate change issue. And as a forest entomologist, I have to say something about the cicadas, the 17-year cicada, the brood that's gonna come out this year. We've already been seeing some out in the field, uh, underneath the logs, we've been looking at it. We're doing a salamander survey, and they're starting to emerge. And they are gonna be quite numerous, probably in the northern part of the state, not so much down in the coastal plain, where Dover and the, and the campus is. But when they come out, you're gonna hear them. They're gonna screech in the trees. Those are the males signaling for females. And I think it's gonna be pretty bad based on the number of exit holes that we've seen in the, in the soil where the nymphs are starting to climb out already. So be prepared for that. The good news is they don't really damage the trees very much. They don't sting, they don't bite, and they're more of a nuisance than anything else. And this will pass and a 17 years will go by and then we'll go through this again. So be ready for that. Congratulations again, Delaware State University, for being our one and only Tree Campus USA for 10 years straight. And I hope you continue on this path. It takes a little time and a little effort, I know, but you're doing an important work here, important work here as far as our urban community forestry goes. And uh, to some of you students who may be in one of my classes in the future, I'll see you then. Hello, Delaware State University. My name is Tahera Tarwala, and I'm a senior natural resources major with a minor in environmental science within the Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Today, I'm joining you from our very own College Woods, located on the campus of Delaware State University. In honor of Earth Day, I wanted to take some time to talk to you today about the importance of our environment and what exactly Earth Day means to me. I have always had a growing passion for environmental protection. Our environment provides us with so many resources and services, it's truly remarkable all that nature has to offer us. Each Earth Day, I like to spend my time outdoors, whether that's doing some gardening or even taking a walk. One thing I enjoy about walking through the campus at Delaware State University is admiring all the different tree species that we have. And what some of you may not know is that a lot of our trees on campus are already pre-labeled with the specific species name. So just by walking on campus, you can learn a lot about the different species of trees that we have in Delaware. And this is the perfect time to do so since Arbor Day is also coming up. Although this is a great day to spend outdoors and enjoy nature and the wildlife, I also like to use this day as an opportunity to reflect on some of the ways we might be harming our environment. Pollution, deforestation, climate change are all real issues that our environment is facing. Each Earth Day, I like to make a goal for myself, a goal that goes towards environmental protection, whether that's donating to an environmental protection organization or doing my part in educating the public about the different ways that they can help protect the environment in their day-to-day -day lives. It can be as simple as recycling, or conserving the amount of water we use, or even by planting a tree. All of these small efforts can make a huge impact if we all do it together. So on this Earth Day, I encourage you to get outdoors and to spend some time thinking about some of the ways that you can help protect our environment and make the planet a greener place. Thank you so much, and I hope you all have a wonderful Earth Day celebration. Hi, I'm Ohana. I'm a grad student at Dell State and Arbor Day means a lot to me specifically because trees give us not only life through the oxygen that they exude, but they also give life to all the plants that are nearby and the animals and species that they provide habitat for. Good afternoon, my name is Marina Kazwe and I'm a grad student working in the Health Lab. 
Uh, Arbor Day to me means a lot because it's a reminder of the various benefits that we get from trees. For example, they help regulate uh, temperatures. They also help um, absorb carbon dioxide from, uh, from the air, hence reducing the effects of climate change. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sharice Winstead Casson, and I am the chair of the Department of Chemistry here at Delaware State University. And I would like to welcome you all to Earth Day 2021. Um, if any of you have known about Earth Earth Day in the past. We had just celebrated our 50th anniversary last year in 2020. So this year is our 51st anniversary of Earth Day, celebrating 51 years of environmental protection in the United States of America. Delaware State University and the Environmental Protection Agency have a long-standing relationship. Over the past 15 years, we have created a memorandum of understanding. And in that MOU, we explicitly state the importance of training for our undergraduates, professional development opportunities, as well as internships and future employment opportunities. We'd also like to highlight for Earth Day 2021 that we have recently been awarded an Environmental Protection Agency source reduction grant and in that SRA grant we highlight the importance of energy conservation, water quality, as well as water conservation. So institutions across the nation are celebrating Earth Day by watching out how they conserve energy, how they conserve water. And so what we would like for you to do as we celebrate Earth Day 2021 virtually is to actually do your part and at home, watch your energy and water conservation as we celebrate Earth Day 2021. Thank you. Happy Earth Day, everyone. My name is Dr. Kimberly Milligan and I am the director of the Delaware State Water Analysis Group, also known as DSWAG. Our lab is a student-led laboratory that will be testing a variety of water samples for microbiological and heavy metal contaminants. Our partnership with the EPA has allowed us to be the first HBCU to seek NELAP accreditation for water testing. This is a huge endeavor for Delaware State University, so thank you, EPA. Good afternoon. So I'm Dr. Aristides Marcano. I'm a professor of the Division of Physics, Engineering, Mathematics, and Computer Science. Today, I'm going to uh, present a new uh, renewable energy teaching laboratories we have developed thanks to the support of the Renewable Energy Education Center. Now, renewable energy actually is a revolution undergoing, and everybody is expecting that in a few years, we're gonna have an, an, an important sector of energy, so the production of energy in the US will be probably the half based on uh, renewable energy sources. The reason uh, for, for, for that is, uh, there are multiple reasons that for that to happen, and we can just discuss a few of them. The first one is that the first one is that the renewable energy is, is becoming affordable, so it's very competitive. And today, for example, the price for solar and for wind energy is less than the price for coal, and is very competitive also with. Uh, with oil and other sources of energy. But one important factor of here is that the more we use green energy, the cheaper it becomes, so the more affordable it becomes. And that's something that opposite to oil or to fossil fuels, so that the more you use or gas or oil, the more expensive it becomes. So in the case of green energy, it's the opposite. And uh, there's all, another factor which is quite important is the environmental impact of renewable energy is minimal. So the, it's mostly uh, the generation of carbon dioxide is mostly related to the production of the devices themselves. But there are other, uh, I just counted more than 20 different, 20 different uh, reasons. So we have that, for example, I like this one. So the original source of energy is, is our sun, it's our star. And, 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 and we know that this is going to be available for billions of years. So, so, you know. There is also a, 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 
the concept of these localities, so the local communities, they are becoming part of the solution and, 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 and they can actually participate in the direct development of revenues. Also, renewable energy will promote the development of local industries. So also the system are very durable. So you, for example, your solar panels can just live for over 20 years. So there are still some wind turbines that were installed in the 70s in California. They're still working, they're still producing energy. So there are other, a lot of, I just wanted a lot of different reasons this revolution is going to happen. So one of the uh, effects that we have is that the big uh, uh, companies, the big oil companies, for example, that the companies that produce energy, they are taking the renewable energy seriously. And they're just uh, planning to invest heavily in the development of renewable energy. In, for example, we have this, uh, this is an example, a small exa example. So the, the Del Marva Power, actually granted to the uh, to our university in a work in a work so some support to start the renewable energy education center that uh, the center started uh, five years ago in 2016 and today it's okay it's ready to to continue to serve the the not only the community of our university but the community the local community and the rest of the of the nation Thanks to the support of the Renewable Energy Center, we were able to develop these labs because they provided the, all the equipment that we have, the software that we need, also the uh, place no, where we can conduct these experiments. Here is the, uh, the Renewable Energy Center as it is today. The director of the center is Dr. Gabriel Guabnesia. And here is it's a nice facility where you can actually have some lectures there, but also you can conduct some experiments on the bottom you, at the bottom of the image. You can see where we can actually conduct to do, uh, do the experiments. Different experiments we have designed it. We have designed it over 10 different labs. For example, this is one of the labs. It's very basic, just to measure the efficiency of a solar panel. So the solar panels, uh, uh, no, this is in a small uh, teaching solar panels, which in a small surface. I would use just a lamp to illuminate that panel and produce electricity. So the the setup is you can see this top on the on the right. We're just using a small sensor to measure the, vol the voltage and in order to measure the amperimeter. So this sensor is combined together. In, 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 the, in the picture, you can see that device, that small device, blue and white, which is connected to the computer. And the computer provides all the, all the information needed for, to conduct the experiment. So the efficiency of this plate is about 11%. This is good. Usually the commercial uh, uh, plates, they have an, an efficiency of 20%. And we, which is, so I think 10%, 11% is something good for teaching purposes. Good, here you have another experiment. This experiment is about uh, taking water, uh, doing the electrolysis of water, you having some electricity and producing some uh, hydrogen. So we just produce hydrogen and the hydrogen can be storage and then it can be used to, when it recombines with oxygen in a special chamber called the fuel cell chamber. So it produces electricity that can be used for any purpose you want. In this case, for powering a small fan. You can measure how much energy you need to produce one milliliter of hydrogen, and then how much energy you can extract from that one milliliter and take an idea of the efficiency of the process. And you see the efficiency is very high. But still, the technology is, is still not very popular as solar and wind. It's mostly related to the cost, so it still needs to be improved in, that, in this regard. Here you have another version of this experiment, which I like it because you have the light coming into the plate. The plate uh, the produces electricity. That electricity goes to uh, an electrolysis chamber, produce the hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen is accumulated in that special chamber, and then you just can close that. You can turn down your turn off your your lamp, and, and then from the just only the hydrogen, you can actually send that gas into the 
fuel cell a chamber and produce some electricity that will power the, the small fan and have that. So when the kids, they, the students, they see that this experiment and they see the device without the lamp, without anything working, and the fan just rotating, they say, where is the energy coming from? So it's the, it's the battery actually, is the hydrogen we produce. The good thing about this experiment is a transformation of energy from light into electricity, into chemical energy of hydrogen, and then chemical energy used to produce again electricity back, and then you use that electricity to produce mechanical energy. So this concept that you can use any, this energy and make some transformations of energy from one type to another type, that's a very fundamental concept that we teach with this experiment. This is another experiment we have in the lab. This is about the thermoelectricity. It seems that when you have two plates at different temperatures, uh, you can actually produce, uh, you can produce uh, some, some electricity. And of course, uh, it's just when you have just conversion of heat into electricity directly. You can also do the opposite effect. You can just take electricity and uh, move heat from one plate to another plate. That's what we call the Peltier effect. So we are just cooling, and we people use these Peltier coolers in, in current electronics. Here you have another experiment uh, we actually conduct just to estimate the efficiency of wind turbines. Of course, these are these are not the real turbines, no, because the real turbines are huge. Uh, but it's just to understand the basic principles. So we can here you can see we have turbines with six blades, three blades, two blades, and, and students can evaluate which is the best system, what how much ener energy you generate. Uh, but per blade, no? I just see that the best system uh, actually if you put too many blades, so you need to invest more money, no, because each blade costs some money. But actually, people have the engineers have concluded that uh, you can actually need three blades. So current and modern wind turbines right now, they are just using three blades. And you, you see these three blades. There is another experiment. We just have blades of different dimensions. And we show that the, the, the power generated no, is proportional to the surface of the blade, of the surface, just yes, when the blades describe during rotation. And, and I think uh, this is an important concept, concept that students uh, learn. This experiment. There is another concept: is that we have we produce, we simulate wind using a using a, a fan, and the fan can allows you to change the speed of wind, so make it stronger, faster, and then you just can see that the power you generate is proportional to the square of the speed of the of the wind, which is a very important concept. So, so people say that if you go high in maybe or 200 meters over the over ground, so you can probably see a lot of wind there, but also you can have a lot of wind uh, offshore. So that's the reason for doing offshore, 20 miles from, from, the, from the shore, it will produce really a very, very effective system. Today, the blades are, people build blades so high that the, the high of the Empire State, and it's very, very good construction, but it produces uh, up to 10 megawatts of power, which is something impressive. So students learn there here are the basic concepts about wind turbine generation. There are other experiments we have developed, and here you have some examples of them. For example, we studied the hydropower generation, just yes, using the hydropower station. But we also characterize light sources uh, that is needed also for understanding how the photovoltaic plates work. But then we study also how to convert gravitational energy into kinetic energy and so on. This conversion of potential into kinetic energy, very basic thing that actually can be included. This, can, this experiment can be included in the, the teaching of physics one, or physics two, or general physics for any, anybody interested in the concept of energy. We also have this 3D printing where students learn how to use this new technology, this idea that you can design over the computer anything and then you just print it. This is fantastic technology. And then you can combine some different solar plates and, and, and see if this is more efficient or less efficient or how you can the geometry of the combination of them and, and so on. 
But a part of that, we're also thinking about developing some experiments on using biofuels, which is something that has a direct uh, impact in agriculture. Uh, but anyway, uh, also we are considering to use this uh, sun, the uh, energy from the sun to just to do some heating, which seems to be very efficient as well, and very important technology that is coming in, and others, no? and other experiments and I have. So in, just in conclusion, so I need to say that we have this uh, laboratories done, we have the guides, we develop them, we have the, all the devices needed to conduct the experiments. They're mostly teaching experiments, it can be done. We have uh, students from the, the K-12 system, some of the, from our uh, uh, early college high school. We also have undergraduate students, even graduate students coming and doing some experiments. But the idea is that, okay, so the, we, we are going to have this transformation in the society that green energy will play a significant role in the, in the production of energy. And I, 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 now, for example, all big companies, on oil companies, they are basically not oil companies, they just energy companies, they produce energy. So it doesn't matter how to produce energy, but they sell energy. They will they understand that the renewable energies are profitable and they will invest heavily on that. But there is a problem. The problem is that we do not have enough engineers. We do not have enough people understanding the basic concepts of renewable energy, <clears throat> of the importance of the renewable energy. And we just need to educate this new generation of professionals that we were thinking about having a bachelor degree in renewable energy. So this is still in, undergoing, just trying to, be, to get the, through the university. But we also can provide some certification programs. But I think we should think about more advanced things like graduate programs in renewable energy. So um, this is all that I have for today. Thank you very much for, for your attention. If you have any questions, and uh, you have any questions, just you can approach me or you can approach Dr. Gabriel Guapnesia, the director of the center, and, and to talk about any anytime you want to talk about green energy or applications of renewable energy. Thank you very much. Have a great day. On Saturday, April 17th, 2021, students, staff, and faculty members from Delaware State University joined together at the Delaware State University Outreach and Research Center located in Smyrna, Delaware. During this Earth Day activity, they put together eight pollinator plots to be displayed on campus. Pollinator plants help support pollinators, such as bees, butterflies, and birds, by providing pollen and nectar to keep them in the area to help with fruit and vegetable production. Pollination is essential for 150 food crops in the United States. According to the USDA, in the U.S. alone, pollination of agriculture crops is valued at a $10 billion industry annually. The first step to this project is to add drain holes to the bottom of your pot so that water doesn't sit and cause any root damage in your plants. Once you've drilled the holes, it's time to add the soil. The soil we chose for this event was a soil that has fertilizer already added. We decided to use a mix of perennials and annual plants that are dedicated for full sun and valuable to pollinators. Once you have decided how you'd like to arrange the plants in the pot, it's time to get planning. Be careful as you're removing the plants from the container you purchased them in. Sometimes the plants could be dry and you might have to tease out the roots a little bit. While you're planting the plants, it's important to know if your plants have become root bound that you might need to score the roots with a knife to encourage new growth. Once you have your plants arranged the way you'd like and planted into your soil, it's time to water your plants and decide where you'd like to put your planter. This Earth Day activity was simple, fun, and something that everyone could do at home. If you plant a pollinator pot, you can help make a difference for our pollinators. There's no better feeling in the world than when a bee lands on a plant that you have grown yourself. We encourage you to join our efforts and make your very own pollinator pot at home. Happy Earth Day and thank you for listening. Happy Earth Day! We would like to thank you for your participation for today's activities for Earth Day and Arbor Day. We hope that you enjoy all the activities. 
and we hope to see you for many Earth and Arbor Day celebrations for many years to come. Thank you.